as part of uh, what's now looked back on as a golden era uh, at the RSC, uh, a lifelong friendship with Judy Dench resulted for me. I, I loved working with her. She was not an easy actress to work with in one sense, in that the audience are all in love with her. You feel rather cut out of it when you're on stage with her. Now, Judy can always be relied on to give you a good time, and she's, uh, I think, would much rather be playing games, silly games. If she decides we're going to do something, then we all do it. And that's a clip from Ian McKellen playing the part. Delighted to say we've been joined by Sir Ian McKellen. Good afternoon to you, sir. Hello, how are you? Nice to see you. Uh, so, uh, the, la- the last time we spoke was for Mr. Holmes, and which, which I think... It's fascinating because this is a film which is sort of you reflecting on uh, on your life, and uh, and in Mr. Holmes is sort of like an interesting primer for that because that's a lot of reflections about a life well spent. Mm. You don't realise until you get old that um, increasingly uh, a lot of your life is is spent um, thinking about being old, and in fact, being old, you know, aches and pains and so on and avoiding them and uh, treating them and talking to your similarly aged friends about them. So to to come across a, a film script which um, in which you're playing a 90-year-old man, which was true of Mr. Holmes, or this film, which is about a, a man in his late 70s, <laughs> me, the fact of age is, is, is uh, a preoccupation that, that you can't avoid, and, nor do you want to really, because I suppose if you were... Uh, wise and, and used your time well, you, you might be contemplating the meaning of life or, or your own life and, and what to do with the time that's left. But of course, you don't know how long that's going to be. So I think probably the best uh, policy is just to take it day by day and, and to make plans for the future on the assumption you're going to be around and you're going to be able to be around. In that interview for Mr. Holmes, I, I mentioned the fact that there was talk that you might write an autobiography which has since, as I understand it, fallen through and you returned the advance and so on. But I wonder why you didn't want to write an autobiography, but you are happy to be in this autobiographical film. It's a sort of substitute, I think. I mean, th- the two problems I had with writing my autobiography was that, A, I couldn't remember. <laughs> well, there's plenty of that I can remember about my childhood, which is of immense interest to me. But there's nobody left I can check on the facts. And indeed, often your memory plays you false. And you you would like, wouldn't you, in an autobiography to (laughs) get the facts right? But if you haven't kept a diary, and if there's nobody around to uh, remember with you, then you're at a real disadvantage. It's it's hard hard work. You're being a historian about a subject you, you think you know well, but it's not always easy to get to know it better. That's one big problem I found. Because I did start sort of plan it out. And the other, more difficult, really, for me, was wondering who would be reading it. And I suppose a variety of people. And if I said uh, the RSC, oh, well, that won't do. I'll have to put the Royal Shakespeare Company. Oh, well, that won't do. I mean, why is it Royal? And who is Shakespeare? And where did he live? And when was he? And what did he do? And, and what's my connection with him? I have to start explaining to people who have perhaps come to the book because it's written by Gandalf something about my life that they have no connection with at all. And equally, for, for someone who's come to it because they're, they're interested in Shakespeare and want to know the musings of, a, of, of an actor who's done a lot of Shakespeare, are they going to have any interest at all in Tolkien? So <sighs> Edna O'Brien, the great novelist, said to me, Ian, write it for your mother, who died when I was 12. Tell her what's been going on and what you've been doing. Well, that's lovely, isn't it? Mm. But uh, that... <laughs> That would do for Edna, but it, I don't think it would do for me. So I, I, so I kept drawing blanks and thinking, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to write this book. Perhaps it shouldn't be a book, a, a narrative at all. It should be a series of, of sketches and, and, and diagrams and, and, and go to page 134 for more on this subject. You know, that sort of book, a sort of encyclopedia. And I thought, my God, an encyclopedia about my life is getting... No. So... I gave myself the nine months back and, and, and had a lovely time doing, I can't really remember what now, not very much actually, uh, enjoying myself. So, so this film is an alternative? 
Well, then Joe Stevenson, a young filmmaker I'd admired enormously for his first feature, Chicken, I do recommend it, said, could could he do a, an experiment with the idea of doing a, a, a one-man documentary? And uh, it involved me sitting in this room where we are now, and uh, and I talked to him, answered his questions for, for nine and three days, and said an awful lot. And it did feel, oh, this is territory that I might have been exploring um, re-exploring in, in, in the book. Uh, it wasn't really a film that, uh, that I could imagine or, or that I didn't think it was my duty to imagine. I was just the subject of it and anyone seeing it will, will <laughs> keep hearing me say, what am I doing? <laughs> you uh, do, yes. And more than that, who am I? That, that's the big problem. Who is this who's talking now? Uh, I, I've just heard my own voice. It's coming out rather Lancashire at the moment, which is when I was born and bred. But for years I spent covering up that accent. I think, didn't think it was appropriate if you were going to play Hamlet. You know, if you're going to play the Prince of Denmark, you shouldn't have a, shouldn't have a Bolton accent. Why not? Albert Finney was doing, doing it with a Salford accent and Tom Courtney with a hull. So you think, wait, wait a minute, is, is that me? Is that my accent? Uh, am I going back to a... Is, is that the real McKellen? So... The film is a little bit about, is, is, is existential the world? I don't know. But it's not my film. I'm in it uh, all the time. It's about me, but I didn't initiate it, and nor did I have any plan at all. So, it, no, it's Joe Stevenson's yes. film. And we see Milo Parker, who is, who is in Mr. Holmes, is your young sidekick. Here he is back again, most engaging presence he is, and he's playing the younger you, which is wonderful. Well, it's a simple idea that Joe had, that when I'm telling a story about my past, suddenly you cut to young Milo being me, acting out the episode, and if I speak, he mimes to my voice. And that goes all the way through. So uh, Sean Mathias, my ex... Uh, and, and a director I, I love to work with plays Tyrone Guthrie, the first uh, theatre director who made a huge impact on me as a young man. And so Sean plays and mimes to my words that I remember. And uh, David Fox, another good pal, is, is, is plays the, the man who uh, allowed me into Cambridge after an, an interview there when I did a bit of Shakespeare for him. So all these friends turn up, uh, Francis, Francis Barber and uh, Luke Evans and so on. So it becomes like a, a family reunion a bit. One of my favourite bits, uh, there's lots in the, uh, in the movie, obviously, about how theatre defined you uh, as a person. But you say that uh, early on you thought that films don't want me. And then, and then you remember that your colleagues were saying, but you were always belly aching mm. about not being in the movies. So was it, do you think that you actually were yearning to be in more movies, even though you don't remember it like that? My parents took me to the theatre from a very early age, and my sister, who was uh, really keen on theatre, and remained so to the end of her life, she was a teacher, but uh, but an, an amateur actor and, and a director, and worked in the amateur box office and everything. They all took me to the theatre. But we went very rarely to the cinema, to the pictures, the flicks, I think because in Wigan, where we were living at the time, my parents had the sense that um, they were flea pits, and uh, and some of them were. And when uh, polio was going round uh, the country, I mean, you didn't go into public places and mix with other people in case you got this dreadful disease. And I, I was told, I was told by my parents, you must not go to the fair because the, the, there was this uh, bug that you might catch. So, I think very early age, when I thought about actors, I thought of actors on the stage. And increase, of course, it was much easier in those days to be a theatre actor. How could you possibly be in a film? These days, of course, nothing easier. You, every student can, can film himself or herself on their, on their iPhone and, and, and make, make a film for nothing. Well, you couldn't do that as a kid. When I was a kid, but you could put on a play for nothing. You stand up and do it, whether it was in your living room or, or with my toy theatre behind the, the clothes horse with a, a towel over it. By the time I, I became a professional actor, I'd had an awful lot of experiences as an as a amateur actor on the stage, but none at all in front of a camera. And when I did my first TV and first film, it was just assumed I'd know what I was doing, though, but I didn't. And, and it took me ages, I mean decades, to come to terms with what was required of an actor in front of 
uh, a camera. And I used to say to directors, please, I don't know what I'm doing. Will you please help me? Yes, don't you worry. But they never did. They never gave me a single note. And I would grub around. I, I would watch Michael Caine on the television talking about how to act in front of a camera and think, oh, oh, I see, that's what I do. <coughs> so I've learnt on the job. But now I've, now I've done so many films, and, and uh, for long stretches with directors who, who have, know what they're doing, and I do pick up a few tips. I really enjoy it. it it's fascinating, as fascinating as, as in earlier days was, was acting for a live audience. You say in this particular film, you would like to divide your film appearances before Richard III and after Richard III. What is the difference and why did that film make such an impact? Well, I knew what I was doing. It was a performance I'd been giving, you know, for 18 months or so for the Royal National Theatre's production directed by Richard Eyre. And I wrote the screenplay with his encouragement, and although he couldn't direct it because he was running the National Theatre, uh, I had landed myself as a potential producer of a film, which I'd never done that before. And I entered the film world and for two years went round to Hollywood and asking people to invest in this idea and 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 finding a director lucked out with Richard Longcrane and, and an amazing cast, Maggie Smith, Jim Broadbent and many others, Jim Carter, Annette Benning, Robert Downing Jr. Suddenly I, w I was in the real world of films and, and I was the top dog. I was playing the main part. I'd done the screenplay and I was the producer. When it worked and I could spend my time as an actor just working out how to do it for the camera. I didn't have to work out what it was I was doing. I knew. I'd learnt that uh, for the previous 18 months. Uh, I felt I'd sort of grown up and the world went round that uh, Owen McKellen could be trusted in front of a camera uh, and was one of us and wasn't a visitor to the world of uh, film. He was a genuine filmmaker. I haven't proved that since. I've never gone back to producing <laughs> or doing screenplays, but... Uh, I think that was the big divide. I was thought to be reliable, and uh, Richard III is a very good film. I, I, I can see that, and I'm very, very proud to have, have made it. And some of your biggest roles, you observe uh, that they're show-offs. So whether it's Magneto, whether it's Gandalf or James Whale, that they you you seem to be naturally drawn to these. And that's your that's your phrase, show-offs. Would you, would you yeah. stick with that? I suppose so. Well, I, uh, most actors are, aren't they, show-offs? All the world's a stage, all the men and women may have occurred to you are merely players, you see. Acting is an intensely human activity, and the animals don't do it. Uh, it's what we do. We're all pretending all day long. We're all, we're all selecting what side of our personality we will present. And it's different for different people, you know. But what you say, the language you use at home to your grandparents is different from the language you use in the playground at school or in the workplace. We're all so capable of that. So uh, to, to observe in the character that you're given uh, to play uh, how good they are at acting, how good they are at being a human being to that extent, is a good, a good approach. And I suppose it isn't just me, you know, who decides what I play. It's the people who offer me the parts. I, 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 I initiate very little. Even this film, all about myself, is not some, wasn't my idea. It was an idea that somebody else brought to me. So, so uh, people must have observed that I'm good at doing this sort of thing rather than something else. Uh, there's no message that I'm giving to the world about uh, myself or anything, really. I, I, do, I do what I'm asked to do, I know. Um, and what do we see you in next? What has caught your attention? What is uh, interesting you? Well... There's a line in Gods and Monsters that Bill Condon directed and, and uh, for which he won the Oscar as, as the screenplay writer. Uh, making movies is the most wonderful thing in the world. Working with friends, entertaining people. Well, you could say as much for any job you were enjoying, I suppose, in my world. Certainly the theatre, that would apply. So when Bill Condon asked me to be in our fourth film... He did Mr. Holmes, and I was briefly in uh, Beauty and the Beast. I said yes, with almost without reading the script, which turned out to be The Good Liar, a very popular novel, written first novel written by a Yorkshireman. Uh, uh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a, 
it's about being old in part it's it's about the past and and whether you can ever be reconciled to it and it's about a con man so acting again um con men are easy to play if they're good con men as as my character is because uh, you just have to play what they seem to be iago very easy part don't play a bad man you just play a good guy honest iago kind iago friendly iago thank you iago the guy is always there dependable not 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 the man who's got terrible terrible psychotic problems inside they just let them look after themselves you, you just get on with the surface uh, and and uh, so playing this common and i'm back with helen mirren who i've not worked with since uh, we did a play on broadway together uh, dance of death and, and other friends too so oh just wonderful and we're filming in london and i can sleep in my own bed at night <laughs> uh, uh, that, that that's such a treat the locations are all within easy reach and that and then it's back to king lear which I did in Chichester last year. So I carry on, uh, and uh, I suppose that's uh, that's what I've observed about being my age. If you can carry on, do, I think, for me. I don't have the distraction, wonderful distraction, of a, of a family, you know, of children and grandchildren. I hear friends who have that, talk about them all the time. That is their life, and they produced the, these offspring, and that's their job completed. My job's not completed because there's always a new script, hopefully, and so there's new, a new adventure, and that keeps me going. And uh, uh, if I know I've got to go on a long journey, either mentally or emotionally or, or physically, then I better get myself fit to do it. I've got to go to the gym, better do Pilates again, better do a bit of stretching, better watch my diet, you know. And all that's very good with um, at any age. So I'm uh, really in, enjoying my life because I know there's not much of it left. You are very aware of that, and nobody warns you about that. Death is inevitable. You don't know when it's coming, but you can be absolutely certain when you're 80, which I am next year, is that it's imminent. Well, um, I think it, <laughs> it falls to me then, Ian, to say, let's hope it's not imminent and uh, you have uh, a couple of decades at least still to go. Oh, yes. <laughs> well, it's possible, of course. It's yeah. possible. And uh, I'm not much of a, a monarchist, but I do take the Queen as some sort of inspiration. <laughs> she seems to be still at it and others too. So, uh, yes, I hope to be one of them, but you never know. No, you don't know, of course. Mm. Ian McKellen, thank you so much. Always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you very much.